Good morning. I am Brandon Crouch, and this is my wife, Kristen. A little bit about us. We've got three fantastic kids, Silas, Isaiah, and Macy. So we've got one in high school and two in middle school. Um, A fun fact about us, those are always hard to decide on what's a fun fact about Brandon and Kristen or our family. Um, Two weeks ago, uh, we were preparing to go on our first family backpacking trip. So we successfully went and came back. Four of us had 30 to 35 pound packs on our back and hiked up to 7,000 feet and swam in lakes and stuff. And one of us had a lighter pack because she's a whole lot lighter. So um, that's a fun fact. So I'm just going to hand it off to Kristen and she's going to tell a little bit more of one of the stories uh, that God has given us. So, and Corey's, <clears throat> Corey's gone this weekend, and so we get to be here with you. So thanks for having us. Um, let's see. So I'm going to start with a story. It's kind of a, um, a big story, a heavy story of our lives. And then, um, and then Brandon will kind of introduce like the art, where we're going to go in Scripture. And then I'm going to do a little history with you guys. Um, so in 2007... Um, Brandon and I had been married for, for four years, and we moved from Phoenix area, where we'd lived for a couple years, and then um, we moved to Riverside, which is Southern California, and I was eight months pregnant with our first baby. Well, we got to Riverside, and we unloaded, and then part of the deal was like, go to visit a hospital, visit a doctor. Um, I, we visited a midwife and a birthing center, and... Um, after a lot of prayer, I'm a firstborn kid, so it was like research and prayer and a lot of, you know, your first baby, a lot of um, unknown and pressure and stress. Um, I really wanted to deliver this baby at a birthing center with a midwife and have kind of a natural experience. <laughs> um, and I felt like the Lord really, um, I, I really felt clearly like the Lord was saying, I'm Lord of your baby, of your birth, of you, of all the babies. Like, I just, I am Lord. And um, what I took that to mean was, um, you can decide wherever you want to have this baby, it's going to be okay. Um, And so we, you know, I went into labor. She was full term. I went into labor. um, But near the end of the delivery, um, her oxygen was cut off um, unknowingly to us and the midwife. And so when she was born... Um, she wasn't breathing, she wasn't able to breathe, and she was transported to the hospital, and I was transported to the hospital, um, but the next day, when they did a bunch of tests and everything on her, um, they just found out all of her organs were not able to, um, she wasn't, she wasn't going to live, um, her organs had had too much oxygen deprivation, and so we had just moved, we didn't know many people. We were at this like really exciting moment in our lives. Um, and um, she just lived one day. So that day we woke up um, and got the news that nothing was good news about, um, the, about, her, um, about her body, yeah, medically. And, um, and so that day she died and we went home without her. Um, that morning, when I woke up, I'm sure like our families and our friends, you know, that we were all praying that she would be okay. I don't remember any of those prayers really. I was in shock, but um, but the but and there's a couple things I remember, of course, <laughs> that are like crystal clear. But um, the Holy Spirit brought to mind a story that morning in the hospital, um, and that's the story we're going to talk about today. Um, it's a it's a story, um, and and it's a really incredible story. And and so that cha- um, we're going to get back to it. But that chapter of my, our lives was like you know the one of the hardest the hardest time. Um, and we've we've all gone through like lots of different things in this room. Um, but the story that we're going to look at today is an incredible story of when um, God like God meets us in those places. So that was um, 
probably the hardest season, and there was more than just that with our daughter. There was other things that we walked through in a very short amount of time, but a very, very difficult season. And anyone who's walked through seasons um, hard like that, or even remotely like that, you know that it's not just like a one day thing or a one month thing or even a one year thing, but that it sticks with you and grieving still today, we grieve things that our daughter doesn't get to experience with us. Our kids don't get to know her and that's still hard. Um, But life is full of all sorts of experiences and it can be confusing. We walk through, all of us walk through confusing times We all walk through lonely times. We all walk through um, times of hurting and exciting, and it's all like tangled up together, right? So this morning, we are going to walk through a story that I think will help us know how God wants us, how God wants us to walk through life. And this story, pretty simply, it's not real long. There's a lot of background to it. But the story holds two incredible questions and one bold response. So that's what we're going to talk about. Two incredible questions and one bold response. And so I'm going to hand it off to Kristen uh, to share some of the story about Hagar. And if you don't know it, we're going to, she's going to walk us through it. But before we do, I'm going to pray, and then she's going to dig in. Father, I do pray that... <clears throat> This is a story that you wrote, that you interacted with this woman, and that you have treasures in this for me and Kristen, and you have treasures in this for each person in this room. Would you help us um, hear what you want us to hear? Would you help us apply what you want us to apply and that we might know you in it? And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we got to do the... The backstory to Hagar. We got to like all get on the same page. Um, if you have your Bible, if you want to open it up, or if you just want to like stay with me, that's totally fine. But if you if you go back to the first book in the Bible, it's Genesis, and there's like so many good stories in Genesis. Um, but if you get to it was like the creation, and then you got the fl- flood and Noah's Ark and the Tower of Babel, you get to the end of chapter 11, and there is a key figure introduced for the first time. And so Abram, who will later be called Abraham, is introduced. And Abram was a man, he was 75 years old at this moment. He wasn't a Christian. There were no Christians. He wasn't a Jew. There was no Israel. He was likely a pagan worshiper. Like, we don't, it does, God does not explain why he picked Abram, or what was happening, but we we land in chapter 11, and this guy named Abram is introduced. Now, in chapter 12 is where I'm going to read a little bit of backstory, because we got to get to Hagar, but we got to start with Abram. So, in chapter 12, um, God calls Abram, and um, so this, I have been taught that this is actually like the pivot or the hinge or the middle of your Bible, even though it's like way in the beginning. But up until this point, like God has created and he's been God of of all these people and generations and stories. But at this moment, he calls Abram and he like, it all pivots to what, to the redemption story of how he will bring Jesus to bless all peoples on earth. So, like, if you can remember, this is a pretty big moment, and it's a pretty cool, like, history story that has incredible implications. So, in Genesis 12, excuse me, 1 through 3, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And then God promises these things to Abram. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name, Abram, great, and you, will, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And whoever, sorry, whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. 
all peoples on earth. Like very, very big promises. And so Abram, the next verse says, so Abram left as the Lord had told him. And so Abram, I don't, like we don't get any of the details of like what Abram thought or why he, I don't know. It's, 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 in, it's crazy, but like this is what happened. So um, if you keep going in the story, which we're not going to do all of it, but there's like Abram travels around. He takes Sarai, his wife, with him. And there's like a few stories in chapter 13 and 14. And then you get to 15. And another moment, a big, big moment happens with Abram. It says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. He said, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Okay, so a little tip or a little side note. This is 10 years later. So in our Bibles, we read, we can read like two or three chapters in a few minutes. But like, we don't always know how long things happen. This is 10 years later. So Abram had obeyed God and left his, his home and they'd been wandering, looking for this promise to happen. But I don't know about you, but 10 years is a long time to wait for anything. Huh? Oh, what? And he's old, yeah, and he's old. <laughs> he's already old, yeah, thank you. So God has this another thing with Abram in chapter 15, 10 years later, I don't know, you know what else had happened, but then it says, but Abram sat, said, oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant will be my heir. Um, so he's like, you told me I'd be a great nation. I don't even have a kid. Like, I'm just me wandering around nomadically trying to do this thing, but, like, I don't know what's going on. And so my servant will become my heir. Like, I'm old, like Brandon said. And then it says, the word of the Lord came to him. So from the Lord, he said to Abram, this man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside. God took Abram outside and said, look up at the stars. If indeed you can count them, so shall your offspring be. Another key verse, Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. Now, Abram didn't always do everything right. There's lots of stories in here. There's like a lot of messy things as, as we'll also find out. But um, there are these like key moments when Abram believes the Lord. It's like amazing example. Um, okay, so Abram, or, so Abram had said, I don't have any kids. You said I'd be a great nation. God like, confirms his promise and says, yep, you're gonna, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And Abram believes them. So they keep going. There's more. I think it's like another year. And um, so now we're in chapter 16, which is where you can see we're actually going to be. <laughs> so, um, so they still have no kids. So Sarai, who's also old, but not a, quite as old as Abram, but like probably six, I think in her 60s. Um, it says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children Go sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So she comes up with an idea. Not a very good one. But she comes up with an idea. And then Abram agreed to it. Um, so kind of two problems here. Um, so it says Abram agreed to what Sarai, Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian servant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. So Hagar gets pregnant, and as, when she gets pregnant, then, as you can kind of imagine, Hagar and Sarai's relationship kind of goes down the tubes, and, there's, um, and Hagar becomes mistreated by Sarai because she's, yeah, I, I mean, we don't have to like, <laughs> but it doesn't go well, and, um, and Hagar starts getting mistreated, by Sarai, and enough that Hagar runs away. She leaves, maybe out of the safety for her life. Like, I don't, we don't know. 
she's mistreated. So if we, I'm almost, we're almost there. But um, if you go to, the, to chapter 16 in Genesis, and you go down a little bit, I think it's 7 or 9. It says, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. So Hagar, I mean, not like a town or a city, but probably like an encampment. Um, they were nomadic. So Hagar, though, was like, I can't stay here. I'm pregnant, and I've got to leave. So she runs away. She finds a spring. So she's pregnant. She's Egyptian. She's a foreigner. She has nothing. Um, and now she's away from, like, her livelihood, which is how she was fed and cared for. And so she's by a spring. So this can just be a picture of, like, desperation and probably completely not knowing what is coming, right? Like, no idea. The angel of the Lord found her. Um, he found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. And then the angel of the Lord um, told her, go back to your mistress. And the angel added, I will increase your descendants, that they will be 100, sorry, too numerous to count. And then there's a little bit more, which I'm just going to, for time's sake. And Hagar responds to this interaction, says she gave the name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And that is why this well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It's still there today. So that's the story um, in the hospital that the Holy Spirit brought to my mind. Um, in my, my, my shock and grief, and I don't even know what, um, I remember that I am seen by the Lord, even in that place, that God sees me. Okay. Um, so that is a story that I have, and I think we often just kind of blow past. So that's the story of Hagar, and then really the star of the show is Abraham. But a few months back, or maybe even six months, I don't know, um, it kind of landed on me in a different way. And so these two questions, the first one that hit me, I don't know why I paused on it, but sometimes just a pause long enough to think is all it takes. The angel shows up to this woman, as Kristen said, who's a runaway servant, slave, who's been mistreated, who's alone, probably has no idea where she's going or if she's going to survive. And this angel shows up and says, where have you come from, and where are you going? So the first question, where have you come from? And I was thinking, surely a servant of the Lord, an angel, sorry, an angel of the Lord showing up isn't casually making conversation of like, oh, really, like what, where, where are you coming from? You know, like what, what's your path? Yeah, what are you doing here? And I was thinking, that is one of those questions, both of those questions that, I don't know what you want to call it, that it's like, like an onion or something, but like as you pull back the layers, it gets increasingly more uncomfortable. So, and I was thinking as well, like with me or with you, as we answer that question, it gets increasingly more uncomfortable. Where have you come from? If the Lord was to ask me, I mean, it'd be easy, easy for me to say, well, I am from Kansas. Um, that's where, I'm, where I came from, and I'm going to Woodland, or I'm going to, yeah, from my mom and dad. Um, yeah. But where have you come from? In this story uh, that Kristen shared, uh, or maybe even a little bit before that, well, I've given my life to Christ, and I want to follow him. And we just finished, if I rewind to where we were with Addy, we just finished our training. We've been in training for years. We're getting ready to go open a new ministry on a new campus. 
That's exciting. But where have you come from? And I think eventually we can come to a place uh, of like Hagar probably of I come from a place of confusion or of pain or of grieving or of loss. And I think giving it enough time and space to like let that sit honestly before the Lord, that's a vulnerable place to be. So where have you come from? And where I've come from, that's one piece I could probably point to, and the Lord could point to a thousand different places of, yeah, that's a place of loss. I'm also coming from a place of joy and a place of confusion and a place of just bad decisions and a place of good decisions. I come from a lot of places. And I think um, as I was considering this, um, this is one of those, these questions just seem to like, since then have just kind of like echoed in my mind over time. So months of just kind of like coming back up. But Brandon, where have you come from? And where are you going? I think um, often, as I observe myself and people around me, we think where we have come from disqualifies us from walking with God or what he wants to do. I think where we have come from, we think that we need to get cleaned up before we can come to God. I think sometimes we think that God can't use someone like me. Or on the other end of the spectrum, we might think maybe not even a different person, but the same person. Sometimes you feel like, oh, I got... Things are going pretty good. I got it all together. God, you're, you're kind of lucky that I'm on your side here, right? <laughs> Which also, probably more unhealthy thinking. Um, but some examples, God tends to take the broken, tends to, uh, I don't think it's right to say he doesn't care about our background, but it's not a hindrance to him. Um, with Abraham, Abram, and Sarai, when he, Sarai began to uh, hate Hagar, and she went, it's just one of those stories that, like, of course this is what's going to happen. Why don't you sleep with Hagar, and then it happens, and then she's pregnant, and then, big surprise, Sarah doesn't like that, and so she goes to Abram and is like, you know, I don't like her. I'm... I have some pretty bad feelings, and Abram's advice, this is like where it all began. Like, New Testament points back to Abram as the man of faith. His advice to his wife, Sarai, was, she's your servant. Treat her how you want to treat her. Oh, yeah. Like, that's not good advice, right? <laughs> and that's what Sarai did. And she mistreated her. And that's the kind of person that God takes and redeems and uses. There's countless people. King David A man, God says, he's a man after my own heart. If he says that about me, I mean, that is a badge, right, of honor. But King David spotted a married woman and said, I want her to be my wife. And then he sent intentionally her husband onto the front lines of battle to be killed. That's also like a pinnacle of bad decision sin. And yet, God used David tremendously. Um, One more on where have you come from. So those are like sin. Another Another story that I love that is in Mark 5, 24 to 34, um, which I'll just tell you. So there's a, these are stories you can pass by, but it isn't a passing by to the people who experienced it. So there was a woman in Jesus' time. There was a woman who had, uh, this is the story of the bleeding woman, but she had been bleeding for 12 years. That doesn't, that's 12 years. That's a long time to be considered by your 
society as unclean. It says that she had spent all she had trying to get better, and the doctors couldn't do it. She felt hopeless. She had no money. And then there's rumblings of this man who can heal, Jesus. And Jesus happens to be coming to her town. And so she thinks, if I could just touch his clothing, I think I might be healed. And so there's, he comes, there's a giant crowd around. She's one of the people in the crowd. She probably shouldn't be because she's unclean. But she sneaks in there and she touches his clothing, his cloak, um, or his robe. And immediately, to her surprise, she could feel in her body that the bleeding had stopped, that she was cured. And probably even more to her surprise, Jesus stopped in the midst of this crowd and says, whoa, wait a minute, someone touched me. And she's observing like the disciples around him, his buddies saying like, what are you, are you crazy? Like probably a hundred people have touched you. <laughs> Why are you stopping? And Jesus says, I know power has gone out, to me, out from me. And she knows that she's been caught or seen or whatever. And Jesus sees her and recognizes this bleeding woman who shouldn't have been touching him and says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. She came from a place of suffering, of loneliness, of hopelessness. And Jesus gave her hope. So where, I mean, that'd be an intense thing also to just think about in a quiet part of the day. I wonder how that woman would have answered the question, where have you come from? Daughter, where have you come from? Before Jesus healed her, where are you coming from? So that's the first question. Um, and my question to you, myself, but I'm asking you the one I already asked myself, where are you coming from? Are you coming from a place of sin or of suffering or of loneliness? Are you coming from a place of bitterness or neglect or confusion? Or is it several of these? Okay, the second question, which I think is more important than the first so the first one is, where have you come from? And then Jesus says, where are you going? And for us, um, we could have said, well, we're going to start this new ministry. It's a new season. It's exciting. We're starting a family and a new ministry. But often, uh, God has different plans for us. I think the longer you live, the more you recognize that a man... Um, plots his course, but the Lord determines his steps is very true. Like we think if we have enough in us to like figure out this is my plan, God often says this, your plan isn't what's going to happen. This is what happens, right? So where are you going? So I, I was thinking of this question or like pondering this question. And then in my, so I try to read the Bible and spend time with the Lord daily. And one of those days I was reading John 14 which is on the slide. Next slide. So John 14, 1 through 7, I thought provided some insight, and it's kind of an awesome story. So it says, um, this is Jesus speaking, and Jesus often speaks in very confusing ways, and this is one of those times. So it says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? So he's talking to his disciples here. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. So we're going to pause there. So Jesus says, you know the way to where I am going. And one of the disciples, Thomas, like can't stand it. <laughs> he's like, what? No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? 
So if we go back to Hagar, where are you going? That's where my mind went. So this, this response of like, how am I supposed to know the way to where I'm going? And then Jesus' response, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I think it has a whole lot less to do with the destination and a whole lot more to do who, who we are going with. We are going with the way. He is going with us, or we are going with him, probably more accurately, um, which took me to, um, I don't think I had up there. Um, John 10 is a fantastic chapter about where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and you are my sheep. And he kind of breaks that open and what that means. But one verse in that, it, it's all worth reading, but one verse that I go back to often is John 10, 27. Jesus says, my sheep, he's talking about me. He's talking, if you follow him, he's talking about you. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So I think our job, our destination is really listening to him and following him. That's what our job is. So a couple of questions for myself, really, but for you is, as we go, uh, as we walk out of these doors and as you go about your normal Monday week, how are you doing at listening to his voice? How are you doing at following him? So that was question number one and question number two. And then the last uh, part is a bold statement. So Hagar's response. So this, I think, is crazy too. So slave woman, foreigner, mistreated, an angel's talking to her. She felt the freedom to give a name to God Almighty. That's pretty big. She says, you are El Roy, the God who sees me. That's a bold move for this woman, but it was truth. A um, couple's places, uh, just real quick. Yesterday, I was reading um, in Luke, and in Luke uh, 1, 47 and 48, basically, fast forward 2,000 years after Hagar, the same truth is being recognized by another pregnant woman, or, yeah, not she preg pregnant. Not, not yet pregnant, soon to be pregnant. 2,000 years, um, an angel had, res had visited Mary, Jesus' mom, and said, you are going to be with child, and he will be the savior of the world. And there's a whole interaction that happens. And then in that part of Luke, Mary, there's a, it's recorded, she has a whole song. And in that song, there are, two, in the, these two verses, Mary says, how my spirit rejoices in God my savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl who from now on all generations will call me blessed. He took notice of me. He is Elroy. He is the God who sees me. So Mary knew the same thing that Hagar knew. Another, one more story, and then I'm going to pass off to Kristen. Another, um, which I think is worth mentioning, story is with Peter. And in Luke 22, 60 to 62, um, so at the end of Jesus' life, he says uh, right before, well, like the end of his time with the disciples, he's, he tells Peter, hey, Simon, you are going to deny me three times. And Simon says, never, never will this happen. I will not. I will die with you. And Jesus patiently knows that it is true, and he just tells him. And so um, then Jesus is betrayed, 
and they get him. They capture Jesus. And then, if you don't know the story, Peter does follow along. He denies him once. He denies him twice. And then this is what happens in the third one. Uh, He's accused of knowing or being with Jesus. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. That's intense. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. This is um, one of those moments that when I'm dead and gone, if it's a possibility that we can like rewind and see moments in history, I would love to see what is communicated in that look. Jesus chose to make eye contact when Peter was at his worst. Denying his Lord what he thought he would never, ever do. He did, and Jesus looked straight into his eyes. And I think, what an awesome Lord. What an awesome Savior. I think he sees not just Peter. He sees you and me. He sees us at our worst, and he doesn't flinch. Isn't that awesome? That he's the God who sees us, and he doesn't turn away in disgust or turn away in, man, you really messed up this time. He sees us in our best moments. He sees us in our worst moments. And all the while, he invites us to come and listen to him and to follow him. No matter which path you're on or where you are at that point, that's what he invites us to. Okay. All right, so as we leave, um, so I'm just going to give a couple ideas for application, but um, really what we want you to maybe take with you is that, is those questions and that response. Like, I think it's a, it's a changing thing to live knowing that God sees us, not just like we're doing our thing and then we can check in or check back when we want, or not even that he's just kind of watching from afar. That's different too, right? That if God is just kind of far away and watches over things, that's a different thing than the stories Brandon just told of, of Jesus like looking or Hagar saying, you, you, I'm, you're the one who sees me, like so to be seen. So um, as we go this week, if, if those questions that the angel, um, if they resonate with you, that's an opt, that's like an idea for you to take with you to maybe journal or when you go to the prayer room or to, um, as you're in your car to, um, think through, what does that mean? Where have I come from recently? Or God, how, what does it mean right now to follow you? Where am I going? I'm going with you. What does that mean? Or what is that? So just to peel back some of those layers, that's one idea for you to take this week. Um, and the other two, just in thinking about that, well, where are we going? We, like Brandon said, we want to we wanna go with him. We want to follow Jesus. And so the foundational ways of doing that are through prayer and knowing him and his word, like going to the Bible. And so if, if, um, if looking at God's word this week is like how you're like, okay, that's how I want to try to follow him and know him more this week, and you don't know where to start, you could pick John, the book of John, and every day this week read a chapter and ask two questions. Um, what does it say about God? Or what does it say about Jesus? What does it say about me? So that's an idea. If um, getting into God's word to follow him and know him more. Um, and, the, and the last one is, um, is in prayer, we can know and follow him more. So whether that's signing up for the prayer room, um, any one of us can do that. And you don't have to be um, at a certain level, or you don't have to really know what you're walking into. Uh, you don't really have to know, ever think, I've never prayed for more than so many minutes. It's okay. You, you could take that step and go sign up for an hour for the prayer room. Um, but 
and you can pray and listen to this one who sees you. So in response to this God who sees us, let's walk and follow him this week together. Thanks. That's it.